Hey, and welcome to the State of Tech Podcast, Episode 2, Google Apps for Education, recorded October 9th, 2011. I'm Sean Beavers, and as always, I'm joined by Eric Kurtz and Eric Griffith. How's it going, Eric C.? Hey, Sean. Thanks. Doing doing well here. Um, got my TARDIS mug with me. Hmm. I'm spilling it all over myself. Well, it's because it's bigger on the inside than on the out. Uh, doing real good. Uh, thanks so much. Um, just uh, got back from a little mini vacation uh, to Cancun. Uh, my wife earned us a vacation through her job, so there's my little souvenir there. Um, so missed a couple days of school, but uh, I told them all that I was going to a conference for uh, for English as a, a second language. So I think it's I think it's fine. They they, they all bought that. So, uh, but yeah, doing doing great. Glad to be here today. Awesome. And uh, Eric G., how's it going? Hey, it's going well. Um, I uh, don't go on vacations. Uh, I wish I could. Um, but uh, next week, I'm looking forward to installing four brand new copiers in our school and uh, replacing the drivers on 450 uh, machines. So, yeah, super stoked about that. It sounds so. like everybody's dream. So, great. All right. And we're also joined today by TJ Houston. You want to say hi, TJ? Hey, how's it going? Awesome, and uh, we'll hear from TJ a little bit later on in today's podcast, but right now, let's dive into the news with Eric and Eric. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, first, we'd like to talk to you about some of the upcoming conferences that are, are going to happen here, and let me share this uh, screen with you here. Uh, the first one is, not that one, it is this one. It's a Tech Tools Conference uh, in fall 2011, sponsored by NWOET and WGTE uh, on October 10th at Bowling Green State University. Go BG. Anybody have anything to contribute about that? I know that the keynote speaker for that one is going to be uh, Rushton Hurley, who is a Google certified teacher. So that should be pretty good. Great. Great. <laughs> And coming up next is the ITSCO conference, and that will be on, it's the ITSCO, it's called the Technology Leadership Symposium 2011, Learning in the Cloud uh, on November 3rd, and that also is in, uh, that's actually the Holiday Inn in Worthington, Ohio. I'm going to be attending that one, so I'm excited for that. Sean was telling us the other day that it was a roundtable discussion, is that correct? Yeah, so that's uh, what they did last year. I think that's the same format they're going with, uh, where you'll be rotating through different sessions at uh, tables in sort of a large room. And kind of the neat thing about it is when you sign up, you get to pick either an iPad, an Asus Transformer, uh, which is a honeycomb tablet, or a MiFi. And I think, Eric, you're, you're getting the MiFi, right? Super, super excited about getting a MiFi. And uh, see, in the past, I've just uh, held my finger up and, and tested uh, the weather and tried to get a good signal. Um, but yeah, no. Never it also makes a nice bell buckle, doesn't it? Yes, yes, that's what I'm going for. So, um, <laughs> next we have the uh, Google Summit, which uh, Midwest Google Summit, November third and fourth, uh, Wisconsin Dells. Um, and I don't have any uh, information. Well, registration is two hundred and fifty dollars uh, for that. I myself am not going to that. Anybody in the group attending that one? No. Gotcha. Gotcha. And lastly, uh, there's this organization, I guess it's pronounced SOIDA, uh, I don't know, uh, but they're doing a conference uh, December 6th and 7th, Dayton Convention Center. I most likely will be going to that one, though, so I've been in the past and got some great information about vendors and other things, and they have some really good conference information. Anybody have any information to share on SOIDA? Uh, I suppose I should say something since I do work for SOTA. Um, we are trying to go with something a little bit different this year, uh, keeping the theme on, on mobile learning. Um, we have some great keynotes. Leslie Fisher is going to be there. Also, Tammy Warchester, I believe is how you pronounce her last name, who is a Google certified teacher as well. Um, so yeah, so it should be good. Great, great. Over to Eric C. for some tech news. Sure thing. Um, besides the conferences, we do have some other things coming up here. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. And for those that are only listening to the audio podcast, it's worth noting we do have a video uh, version of this podcast as well. So sometimes when we're stammering around here trying to uh, pull things up, it's because we're doing that for the video portion of it. However, it's worth noting also that everything we're sharing is in the show notes as well. So if you are only getting the audio version or, or either way, that's perfectly fine. Just head to uh, the stateoftech.org and the show notes has all of the links to all the stuff we're talking about. Uh, a couple of quick 
quick news bits for Ohio uh, area this uh, this episode. First is um, there's a due date coming up for the um, Ohio K-12 uh, network application. Uh, basically, we get money, uh, I think it's uh, $1,800 per building uh, for uh, connectivity. And um, it's just, it's there each year, and basically you just have to be able to fill out a couple of things. I remember we had to upload like a WAN diagram and fill out a little bit of information um, about uh, each of your buildings, but uh, then you end up getting that funding for the next year. So just make sure you don't miss the due date. It is October 31st, and you would hate to have that slip by and lose that money for your connectivity. Um, next thing to mention is the call for proposals for the eTech State uh, Tech Conference. Uh, the conference this year, um, as in the past, is in February. This time it's uh, February 13th through 15th, and that's in Columbus as usual. Um, but the deadline for submitting a proposal is coming up really quick. So depending upon when you're listening to this, it may have already passed, but this upcoming Wednesday, October 12th um, at midnight, you need to get those uh, proposals in. And it's not a really terrible process to fill that out. Um, just uh, you basically have to explain you know what your what your sessions about and tell a little bit about yourself and what's nice is you do get um, a free um, you get free admission for, for the day you're doing the proposal so or for, for the day you're doing your session so that's nice it does help cut down on your cost um, I've presented many many years there I'm gonna plan to present again as well this year um, I don't know do you guys have anything to say about the eTech conference I want to give a, a shout out to it I think it's a great conference um, I just hope there's no ahead. snow. Yeah, hope oh. there's no snow like in previous years. So yeah. yeah, yeah, we've had we've had some rough weather. I mean, I remember, um, and, and Columbus has a hard time dealing with that. Sometimes we had that crazy snow a few years back, where it was like you had to. I was driving my SUV, and thankfully, I was able to just kind of plow through these snow drifts in the middle of High Street. It was it was fun. But yes, we will hope for good weather in February. But it's Ohio, so you never know. So definitely, guys, fill that out and 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 share what awesome things you guys are doing. Um, next up, uh, the beta. Um, so that's that survey that we all took back in the spring. Uh, we as tech directors filled it out, but also your teachers filled it out, giving information about technology and how they're using it and what they want to know about and so forth. Uh, just FYI, the beta results are here. They're available now. You can go to eTech's site and get all that information. It's really helpful uh, to help you kind of get a good grip on your district as to what's happening in your district, but also to compare your district to other districts in Ohio. It's good for planning and for PD and things like that. And the last little bit of tech news, um, Mike DeWine has uh, put out a uh, video contest for high school students on internet safety. Just a quick FYI that the kids have until December 15th to make a 60 second video on internet safety and can earn some scholarships. I think from $1,000 all the way up to 2500 So again, all that information available in the show notes um, if you uh, want to check out any of that stuff there. And that's pretty much our news. All righty. All right. Thanks, Eric and Eric. And uh, if you do go to our website, thestateoftech.org, there is a section there where you can submit tech news uh, in, or, in and around the state of Ohio. So if your organization or school or really anyone who wants to submit, submit something, uh, we would be happy to share that during our podcast. Okay, so now we're going to get to our, our next segment, which is the awesome thing of the week. And uh, this is where we're going to share maybe a, a mobile app with you, iOS, Android, or uh, perhaps a website or a Chrome extension, uh, really anything that we've, we've come across uh, since our last podcast. So we're going to start off with uh, Eric C., and he's going to share his awesome thing of the week. All righty, very good. Well, let me pop back to sharing that screen there for you. Uh, what I went with was a uh, Chrome um, extension. Now, I love Chrome as a web browser, and certainly I, I would recommend that to anybody, uh, especially if you're using, you know, any uh, web-based applications like like Google Docs. It's just a really, really great uh, browser, very fast. Um, but um, one thing that we're doing as a district more and more is trying to move everything into the cloud as much as we can. And myself personally, I'm trying to do more and more and more stuff in the cloud. So. Um, I have found um, at least a few extensions, but this one in particular to be a, a really a really nice one. It's um, it's called Cloud Save, and basically um, it's just a free Chrome extension. Um, you can just get that in the the Chrome web store. Just search for Cloud Save, and what it does is it installs this extension. I'll pull up a I'll pull up Google's web page here just to show you. Um, 
basically anything that I come across, I can save automatically into multiple different cloud-based storage systems. So like, here's just the Google logo, and I'm just clicking on the Google logo with a right click, and I get my pop-up menu, and you'll see that cloud save is one of the things that pops up there. And it lets me take that Google picture, and I could save it to my Picasa account, I could save it to Dropbox, I could save it to Google Docs. It works for PDFs, it works for Office documents, it works for all sorts of files. And I found this to be really, uh, really helpful uh, when I need to be able to grab a picture and then and save it and insert it into something later or grab a document and I just want to put it into Google Docs or, or Dropbox or in, in Picasa. I use all of those different ones and that's been really useful for me. So um, just a, a quick useful um, extension that will help you take one more little step into the cloud and uh, it's called Cloud Save and I would recommend that to anyone. That is awesome. I definitely think I'm going to have to install that uh, into my other 60 plus <laughs> extensions that I have yeah. running in Chrome. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I'm going to share my uh, awesome thing of the week, and mine is actually an app for uh, iOS, specifically for the iPad, so let me pull that up here. And this is called Book Creator. It just came out, I think, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's $6.99 currently, so you know, that price could change at any time, uh, for those of you familiar, obviously, with the App Store. But what it allows you to do is create eBooks on your iPad, and so this is really awesome. Uh, awesome thing of the week, because before you know playing around with with Microsoft Word and then trying to get that into Caliber and you know convert that into an ebook or you know for those of you who are using a Mac you you might be using Pages to do this. Now you can do this right on the iPad. So it's very simple. You can create your cover, uh, pull images from your photo roll or from any of the uh, photo photos that you've synced over from your computer and then add your text and it functions much like a, a desktop publishing application where you can move those and put those anywhere on the page you want and then simply just export that right to iBooks. So it really works well uh, and I think it's going to be great you know, for teachers as well as students to be able to publish their, their work, whether that's poetry or, or anything they're currently working on. So that's my awesome thing for the week. Great. Yeah, sorry, I was busy uh, installing Eric's app there so uh, for myself but uh, my awesome thing of the week is something that I could not live at all without ever since I started uh, my job as uh, you know dealing with technology I have used um, remoting tools to you know get the job done you know you can't be at work 24 7 even though I try uh, as much as I can so my awesome thing of the week is called log me in central and I found a coupon that only um, cost me $150 for the service. And even though LogMeIn is free, I can create an MSI file and deploy this throughout my network. So it automatically installs, it grabs the name of the ma machine, and just with a couple of clicks, I can log right in to any of the machine, whether I'm here at my house or on my iPad or an Android device or any web browser. It allows me to remotely do my job from wherever. And that is crucial uh, in, in my line of work. So. But uh, that is my awesome thing of the week. Thanks. TJ? Is that a Mac and PC or is that just PC? Just curious. Mac and PC and it's free. Uh, it's free for just log me in. The entire service is free. But log me in central uh, they want um, $150 for. And I guess I should include log me in central allows me to, let's say I have a vendor um, who wants to, you know, remote in, do something to my server, I can create a temporary login for him, and I can see the screen as he's logging in to do it. So I can give somebody, uh, you know, 256 encrypted, you know, remote access right to a machine with a couple clicks uh, of the mouse. So it's, it's an awesome, awesome application. Can I so throw in something else that's through log me in? Sure. Sorry. Sure. Um, Join.me. Um, yep. I don't, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that, um, but all you really have to do is give somebody a code, and it's all web-based, and they instantly have access to your screen, so this is good if you're family tech support, mm -hmm. um, and that's join.me, worth taking a look. It's similar remote access from anywhere. And that is an excellent one. I'll throw one more thing in about join.me. <clears throat> it's also really good if you want to share with multiple people. Um, you can have, I don't remember how many it is, but a very large number of people can connect to you through that so you can be showing a screen to a lot of folks if you're doing like a screencast or something like that. It's a great service. Absolutely, absolutely. And all from LogMeIn 
uh, dot com. They're you know my they have been my favorite uh, uh, remote service uh, for the longest time. I mean I've used them all VNC, uh, Ultra VNC, Type VNC, you know RDP, everything else. By far, LogMeIn makes some of the easiest stuff to use. So yeah, but, yeah, that was it. All right, great. Um, so I think we'll probably uh, at this point jump in uh, to I would say the main topic for today's podcast, which is Google Apps for Education. And uh, TJ, welcome again. If you want to go ahead and just introduce yourself and uh, share a little bit about what you do. Sure. Thanks, guys. Uh, my name is TJ Houston. I run a blog over there at tjhouston.com, um, and I'm, I also am the tech director for Huron City Schools um, up here by the lake in Huron, Ohio. Um, we've been using Google Apps now for about a year and a half where student use um, and teachers were 100% off. We just got off a of first class for our email. Uh, we moved that before summer, and now teachers are fully on to Google Apps. So, Excellent. And, uh, you know, for those of you out there who may not be familiar with Google Apps and uh, or maybe you're just starting using it for the first time, we're just going to kind of go through some of the features of Google Apps and... Uh, let me pull up that Google Apps screen here. All right, so if you're not familiar with this, it's a free suite of web-based communication and collaboration software. And this is made available to K-12, higher ed, and nonprofits for free, uh, absolutely free. There's, there's no hidden costs, so you're not going to sign up and then uh, find out that you have to pay some huge bill later. And this includes Google's core applications. So that includes Gmail, Docs, Sites, Calendar, um, Google Groups, video, and chat. And so Gmail, I, I think, is sort of the, the cornerstone uh, or keystone, if you will, of the whole suite, uh, which is, your again, your email program. Then you have Docs, which would be the equivalent of Microsoft Office, and that includes presentations, spreadsheets, documents, forms, and drawings. Uh, sites, which I, I think is really sort of, I think of it as sort of a do it all Web 2.0 tool because you can make sites into a wiki, you can use it as a blog, um, you can use it to simply for online file storage. You've got Calendar, Google Groups uh, to set up some forums, Google Video so that you can host video internally uh, within your school's district or your school, and then also Google Chat. Now that doesn't mean though that all the other tools that you're used to using, so if you're already using Blogger or Picasa Web Albums or, or Google Voice, you can certainly use those, you can turn those on for your domain um, as well. So pretty much all the Google tools are there. Um, the most important, I think, aspect, at least for me um, and, and for the teachers that I've done professional development with, is that this is accessible from anywhere. You know, as long as you've got a capable device uh, with a decent web browser, you can access uh, all of these applications and your information very easily. And, you know, Google hosts all this for you. You don't really have to do anything other than provide uh, a domain name. So, uh, anybody else want to add anything? I've used Google... Uh Gmail ever since 2006, and yeah, I've never looked back. It's uh, next to log me in. That's my uh, favorite service. So, yeah. And as far as just a, an overview of Google Apps, uh, it might be worth throwing in that. Keep in mind, this is modular. I mean, you don't have to use everything that Sean just mentioned. I mean, we pretty much do, and I think it's fantastic. But really, you can pick and choose. You can turn things on or off and decide just what parts you want. Maybe you just want to roll out, you know, email to your students, and this is the way to do it. Or maybe you just want collaboration with Docs. So you can just pick and choose as well. Although the whole suite is available to you. Right, and, and that, you know, I think that's one of the nice things that, you know, you can roll this out slowly, you know, don't feel like you have to turn on everything at once, you know, usually I think a lot of times people just start with the email and, and then, you know, kind of it blossoms from there, but, uh, you know, that's great that you can turn on certain things for certain organizational units or for certain groups, it's, it's really easy to set up. Okay, so, uh, you know, TJ, uh, it's, you know, talked a little bit about his sort of scenario and, and his district. Uh, Eric C., you want to talk a little bit about uh, North Canton? Yeah, um, and, and this may be a little bit different than some of our episodes because we actually, as hosts this time, do use Google Apps. Some of the things we talk about we might not be uh, experienced with, but in this case we all are. Um, with North Canton, I'll go ahead and pull up our, pull up our site here. Um, 
There we go. Um, with North Canton, we've been using um, Google Apps for two years now. We rolled it out uh, last school year, so we're actually in our in our second year of using it. Um, just give you a little bit of an idea. Basically, um, we are a suburban school. Um, I'd say a medium-sized school district. We have about 4,800 students, about 600 staff members, um, but um, probably similar to many, many schools, uh, just you know, really challenge as far as our budget goes. And so a couple of years back, you know, what made us really look at this was just we were unable to do a whole lot of new things with technology because we could not afford to upgrade Office or we could not afford to roll out a lot of new um, things. And so we were looking, well, we need to find something new. And Google Apps really was the was the perfect match for us. It allows us to do just so many amazing things. And hopefully we'll share a couple of examples here in a while about some of that stuff. But we uh, we've rolled that out for our staff. Uh, and for our students as well, all the way from K through 12. So everybody's using it, and uh, we started with staff first. Uh, did a semester of that before rolling out to the students. But uh, halfway through last year, we were all on 100% and using pretty much all the different pieces of it, um, and it's going really, really well. All right, and uh, Eric G, you want to share something about Mechanicsburg? Sure. Uh, Mechanicsburg here. Let me bring up the screen there. Uh, this would be the the start of my second year at Mechanicsburg, and uh, as their director of IT. And in the past, you know, they had uh, Office 2003. They have you know, 450 student machines, and you know, they really weren't getting a lot out of Microsoft Office. So this over the summer, I put together a team of Google teachers and uh, trained them how to use Google. <clears throat> and they taught the rest of the staff in uh, small groups. And that seemed to work out fairly well. Um, you know, it wasn't 100% integration um, right from the start, but, you know, we started with Gmail, moved to Docs and everything else. And, you know, we have faced certain challenges with, um, you know, a variety of things, which I'm sure we'll talk about later in the show. But, um, you know, our, ours is a smaller school, you know, 972 students, I believe. So 120, between 88 and 120 staff members, depending on bus drivers versus uh, maintenance staff. But I, I made sure everyone was trained in Gmail, from the custodians to the superintendent. So that's uh, that's all. All right. So kind of you know talk a little bit about what are some of the benefits that each of you has seen. Um, you know, I'm kind of I guess the the odd man out this week since yeah you know, I've done professional development in schools, but I you know really haven't rolled this out to to a district. So um, whoever kind of wants to jump in and just talk about you know what are some of the benefits you've seen with the different uh, you know staff, students, administrators in your district. Well, I can jump in and I can jump in and start. Um, one thing that I've found. Um, with Gmail, it's all web-based, so before we had first class. So staff would have to set up a client at home, and there was all this rigmarole they had to go to. Now they go to any computer, and they have access to their calendar. They have access to their documents. They have access to their you know, email at any computer. You know, Our staff needs that information. I mean, you know how teachers are. They're making their lesson plans at home. You know, they need access to that wherever they're at. And Gmail and Google Apps just provides that for them, that anywhere access that really allows them to work, you know, wherever they are. And me too, I could be at any computer login, here's that email, here's that product key, you know, have instant access to all that information. And you have, have you found too, one of the things that they like, and I don't know, um, you know, how many faculty and staff have smartphones, but that they can sync it to their BlackBerry, they can sync it to their iPhone, you know, that, that that's very easy to set up as well. Yeah, and they can just, I mean, you give them the information and say, yeah, well, most modern smartphones just have a Gmail button that they can use, and it's very easy to use. And one thing that I like at from the administration side is Gmail, I, I kind of trust Gmail a little more than I trust, you know, our own network, only because of the redundancy. And you know, my email is missing. Well, let's look at your filters. Like, it does just doesn't, shouldn't come up missing. Um, so I have faith in Google a lot more than I did, you know, for our own servers, just, you know, they have more redundancy. So that's one nice thing from the administrative side, you know, is, you know, it's, it's always up, you know, 99% of the time it's up. I agree with uh, TJ there. We, we moved away from uh, Exchange and, um, uh, I've noticed uh, my hair growing back from the sides, and I, I think I've added maybe two to three years onto my life uh, just getting rid of the, the headache and stress that 
that I had to deal with exchange, the, the backups, the everything else, missing emails, variety of you know crazy like that, and the fact that I'm not paying for a server in my building. It's not you know uh, costing me so much money to run it here to upgrade the license, anything like that. You know, huge cost savings. And to piggyback on that idea of the access anywhere, anytime, um, that is a, a real critical element if your school's looking toward moving into like uh, the bring your own technology ideas. And that's actually a topic coming up on one of our uh, next episodes. Um, but it, it kind of paves the way for that, that um, because you know, you're saying, and this is sort of our, our philosophy here at North Canton is, is we want um, you know the North Canton technology experience to be available to anyone anywhere you know through a web browser so it doesn't matter if you've got a Mac or a PC if it's a laptop a desktop a smartphone if you're at home or school or the public library if you can get to the internet you can get to the technology experience we want to provide and Google Apps really allows that because I mean I was in Cancun like I said I know I know you guys feel bad for me but I mean I I didn't want to come back to 500 messages and which I would have I mean I would have had 500 emails you know in there so you know each night when you know things slow down or whatever I popped open my laptop and jumped on and I was able to function perfectly like I was just in my office because I've got all my email I've got all my calendar I've got all my docs and I could do whatever I needed to same thing on the airplane we flew air train and they've got wireless on there so I'm on the airplane you know, stuck there for two and a half hours I got you know all these emails answered you know so yeah the anytime anywhere access does really you know provide um, that structure you're going to need if you're going to move into something like BYOT. If you want to extend the learning outside of the school day, if you want to extend it outside of the brick and mortar school, that is really an excellent thing to help you do that. And I think, and I don't know if you guys will agree with me, but I think too, one of the things I always talk about is how to me it levels the playing field in a sense that, you know, it doesn't matter, like I think, you know, Eric, you were saying, you know, maybe Eric G, or you, you know, you had Office 2003, or, you know, somebody's got Office 2007, maybe somebody's using WordPerfect, or, you know, that really sort of moves uh, all of that out of the way, and like you said, as long as you have some kind of browser, you know, and you're using a, you know, whatever the latest version happens to be, and you've got an internet connection, everybody can use this, you know, it's, it's not like, oh, I can't open this file because, you know, you save this in pages, or, you know, I can't use this because I'm, you know, currently, you know, I've got a Pentium 4 or something like that. You don't have to have the latest hardware to really leverage, you know, the power of Google Apps. And I think, too, it's one of our big things is preparing students for college. Um, and part of that is, you know, having access to that information. But, again, like you, you had said, not having to worry about versions. Um, to be able to save it as a PDF, export whatever you're working on as a PDF, that way it can't be changed. I mean, that's just a beautiful thing. And preparing those students for college, now they have access to it wherever they're at in the lab. You know, and that's one thing that we have to show them is, you know, look how easy this is to use. I'm in classes right now at BG, and we're using Blackboard, and we had to come together to create a presentation. We all ended up exchanging slides, and I kept saying, you know, we need to use Google Apps. We need to, you know, look, I can set this up. It's worth it. But they ended up just emailing PowerPoint. Hey, yours is in PPTX. It doesn't work with my version. It just alleviates all that. And it's real time, so like if you need to make a change, everybody sees it. Hey, we're all going to get together at 5 o'clock and kind of put everything together, you know. And, and, and you just, know, one of the arguments I've heard kind of going along with what you're saying, TJ, is, you know, well, we have to teach students how to use Office because that's what they're going to be using in college or that's what they're going to be using in the business world. And, you know, I always think, okay, well, yeah, but what version of Office are they going to be on? You know, are they going to be on 2015? Are we going to be on 20, you know, 2012? I mean, you know, I, I think really it's more important to show them, like, like you were saying, you know, how to collaborate, how to communicate, really teach those 21st century skills and how to make a good presentation regardless of what software they have available to them because and I think Eric G and I have talked about this a while in the past, you know, you may not have Office, you know, you might have Keynote, you know, but you still should be able to, with whatever tools you have, you know, be able to, you know, create a document, create a spreadsheet with, without any trouble, you know. Absolutely, and, and to add on to that, um, you know, create the document with the you know, without the fear of, oh, geez, you know, am I going to lose this document? Because the second you create the document in Google Docs, it's there. It saves every, you know, 0.26 seconds or something crazy like that. I've, I used to get calls last year all the time, hey, my machine locked up. You know, Eric, I know it's 10 years old, but uh, is there any way to get my document back? And the answer is nine times out of 10, no, not so much. I'm sorry. This year, yes, the equipment is still 10 years old. 
yes, the machine still reboots, but magically when they get, you know, they launch Chrome, they go right back into their, their document is saved, and, you know, they're, they're amazed that, hey, I, you know, I still had to wait four minutes for the computer to reboot, but, hey, I'm right back where I was, so... I did notice, too, there's a lot less dogs eating homework with it as well. <laughs> they can't really use that excuse anymore. Well, you know, and, and, that, and that's a good point. We've seen, um, it's not like a major, you know, awesome, you know, uh, thing, but it, it does make a difference. When students come in to show their presentations, we're not pulling out CDs, and we're not pulling out flash drives, and we're not trying to, you know, load things up in class. The student simply shares their presentation or their document or whatever with the teacher, and it's time to do the class presentations. All the teacher's doing is just going right down their docs list. Okay, who's next? Click, and it's up and it's running. I mean, they say this, the, the downtime in class has been reduced significantly by everything being shared. So, I mean, not groundbreaking, but hey, every little bit helps. And you, and you probably don't have the uh, students bringing in everything on a flash drive now either, right? Or, or you know, on a CD right. or something like that. Correct. Right. And then there's the uh, verification that there was collaboration. You know, you can look at any doc or anything like that. I assume that's what TJ was going to mention <laughs> where I stole it from him. So. Um, but, yeah, that you know, the fact that they can look back and say, well, I know you said you were working with the group, but... You know, it looks from the revision history that you didn't really do anything. Or one of my favorite things this week was uh, a student copied and pasted an entire article right into Google Docs and then said, oh, I typed that out. And I thought, really? Because it looks like you typed nine paragraphs in about two seconds. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not seeing that you really, you know, spent time typing that out. And so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot easier. And as long as the professional development is there for the teacher to say, oh, I see how, you know, I see what this means, you know, you, you explain to them how revision history and things like that work, you know, it's it's a great, great service, great application. I've seen teachers actually go back, like if the drop dead date was midnight one night, I've seen them revert one, two pages, whatever was after midnight, I've seen them revert back to midnight and that's what they graded. So you wow. know, okay, there's no, wow. oh yeah, this was midnight's when I finished it. No, like, and they'll go back to it in the middle of the sentence, and that's how they'll grade it. Wow. And there was a teacher, I was at a conference, and she said, I was like, wow, I wouldn't want you as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> as far as that's concerned. That's pretty harsh. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think, you know, in thinking of, of teachers, one of the things that seems is, you know, um, forms is really, I think, what gets people hooked. You know, that they can see, okay, I can, you know, create a self-grading quiz maybe using Fluberu or, you know, or I can, you know, use these different templates and, and make an online survey. Or I know um, Eric C., I think you're using that for uh, registration this year, correct? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. We yeah, use forms for just about, just about anything, but that is correct. Um, we um, switched our kindergarten registration over this year from being something that, parents would come in and fill out paper after paper after paper after paper um, to instead just being a Google form and then all that information is nicely collected into the spreadsheet in the background and then it's not a matter of people trying to read and going now what did they write there and because it can be hard it really it, it can be very difficult to sometimes read what people end up filling in in the forms well since it's all typed boom it's just it's just all done right there um, and that has saved us a whole lot of time and it's made that much more efficient um, if somebody has needs help with that then they can certainly you know work with 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 a secretary there who who help them through that process but sure yeah I mean we've used forms for that we've used forms for so many things anytime we need to collect information from parents for surveys um, uh, we could go on and on and on about that. Maybe some of you other guys want to throw out a, a form example. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, earlier, and I'm trying to pull it up as we speak, um, I actually figured out and I shared it on the apps user group page, which we'll throw in the show notes. Um, the form that I created, I have this difficulty where I won't record mileage from building to building just because I actually have to do paperwork, and it's more important to me to be you know, helping teachers, and that's just one thing that I haven't done. So what I did with Google Forms was I had a starting point and ending point, and that would take, I had a preset for our buildings, so I could you know, hit two things and hit submit, and what it would do is it calls out to the Google Maps API, and then it pulls that back into the spreadsheet, and it says exactly how many miles it is, so I can do a total at the end of the month and see exactly what my mileage is. 
but I also did an other category that you can put in any address and so that way it'll give you that mileage so if I go to a conference but taking that one step further in the cell in the spreadsheet it'll actually give you the turn by turn directions so within a matter you know with one form I not only got my mileage but I got directions to wherever I'm going um, and I did post um, it's in the apps user group site, group site as well as my um, my blog tjhouston.com and I think it was mentioned too Fluberu um, I've been showing more and more teachers that um, Fluberu is basically a way for teachers to um, grade tests instantly um, by using a form and it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, just to see how it works and the methodology behind it, um, and it's really easy to set up. I would have no problem, you know, with any of my teachers, you know, having them set up. And again, I did a little tutorial on how to create tests and stuff. Um, TJHouston.com, but also um, just Google Fluberu, and you'll find a lot of people um, are actually talking about it as well. One thing I wanted to point out there, too, with those self-grading quizzes, if you look at the templates gallery, there are three templates there as well that you can use to set up uh, self-grading quizzes. I think there's one for a 10, a 15, and a 20-question quiz. Eric, uh, Eric G., any, any thoughts on forms? Uh, we typically have used forms for surveys. Uh, I did a software audit uh, at the beginning, uh, I'm sorry, the end of last year where uh, I asked, the staff, uh, you know, what software to use in your computer, and uh, at the time I had uh, the restrictions lifted so that teachers could install anything they wanted, and, you know, I was just trying to gather uh, that information, and uh, I got, out of uh, uh, 88 actual teachers, I had over 160 uh, responses of, hey, I use this software, I use this software, and it was really nice for them because they could also go back, and the, the fact that I had the form posted um, to be public, they could go back and see oh, which one was listed, which one wasn't, and uh, just an amazing, an amazing piece of technology um, beats the the crap out of uh, Survey Monkey. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anything else? Anything else with Docs? I know it seems like you know we've been kind of focusing on that, but um, you know certainly we also want to talk about you know if you've been using Calendar or or Gmail or sites, uh, you know anything else you guys want to throw in in terms of how you've been using those tools? As, uh, as far as, as calendars, um, since we came from Exchange, um, we only had maybe one or two, maybe three sites that were up. Uh, no, I'm sorry, three calendars that were up that was a you know high school, a middle school, and a district calendar. And you know they updated the content on that. But, but since we've gone to Google Sites, or Google Calendar, rather, um, you know all of our labs, um, almost every, uh, yeah, all, all the labs, almost every room that you can rent out has its own calendar and uh, just a, a tremendous resource. The fact that it's easy enough to send that out to a staff member so that they can um, subscribe to that calendar, uh, just, you know, communication was uh, improved greatly because of that. And it was a, it was a shame, you know, it, it was the same concept in Outlook or Exchange. It's just nobody ever sat down and, and put the time into uh, making that work. And with Google Calendar, I have just about every um, you know uh, different grade level teacher is, is making some sort of their own calendar for something. So I myself have one for software and uh, backups and reminders. It's just a hey daily to do list of am I supposed to go through and check the filter for this? Do that? I mean just any way I can think to uh, write things down um, for myself using Google uh, Calendar, that's that's what I'd use it for. So, yeah, I wanted to touch on that too. Um, let me see if I can share my screen real quick. Um, we are using. Um, I've noticed a big jump to wanting to do this style, where it's an agenda view. Um, so that way teachers can put their assignments in there so parents can subscribe to the calendar, um, you know, administration can see exactly what they're doing. And this is just the fifth grade. Um, and this is something that they just started and they said, hey, couldn't we do this? And I said, sure, I mean, it's no problem. Um, and they can jump into an agenda view, throw it up during study hall, and they can see everybody's. And the teacher, again, making it more simple for the teacher before they'd have to log into the website, you know, add to their page what the assignment was, and then bounce back. 
this is an example of just saving time. They're already the teacher is in their email all day. So if we can make their documents accessible from right there, we can make their calendars easy to use and right there, then why not? Another thing I found too, our district calendar. Um, this is the whole district and you can see how it's color coded differently. Um, so a parent could come here and see, oh, what's going on Monday? Oh, it looks like Shawnee has fire prevention week. Um, and then Tuesday, it looks like the fifth grade is going to Putin Bay. And they can see that. And everything's separated by color. So a parent who has parent, let's say a parent has a student in three different buildings, they have one place to go. And they, they can just subscribe to this, no problem. And we do the similar thing with our sports. So we can subscribe to an all sports calendar. I'm a photographer, so I like to see exactly when all the sporting events are so I can go there and shoot them, and I have all that just in a single calendar. So uh, are you saying that your teachers use Google Calendar almost as an online lesson planner where they're posting, they're adding attachments to assignments or docs up there as well? Yes, and that's one thing that I showed them um, this week is, look, you can add an attachment. Like you can actually have the worksheet or whatever you're working on as an attachment for the event. And, uh, and they were just thrilled with that. And, you know, you almost don't want to have separation because we do have progress book. So you don't want them to, you know, get like don't use progress book to use this. And it's just finding that balance of look what you can do. I'm not saying don't use it, but it is a possibility. Um, and one thing, this I just wanted to show her this off real quick. Um, this is a Google Sites. I don't know if we're two Google Sites yet, but um, this is something that she had created just because she didn't like the way our website had web, I mean, built things. And Google, what's nice about it, it's what you see is what you get, and it's really easy for a teacher to do. Now, this is the teacher that came to me and said, I'm the worst person in the district for technology, like many of us have heard a lot. And, you know, this is what she was able to come up with. And then from here, she was able to actually just tie in her Google Docs, and then this is shared with her team. Um, so this is just a different way of doing it, I guess. Um, and this links to, again, another Google Doc. So she can change, it was easier for her to change the Google Doc instead of doing multiple sites by just embedding, you know. And this is a good way to tie in. Everything in Google kind of works together, meaning you click embed and you have a list of all your docs, your calendar. And it's just a really nice ecosystem for the teacher to be in because it makes it really easy for them. And don't you think, uh, you know, one, I, I think... It, like you said, it's easy to use, and if you can use, I think, uh, if you're familiar with the word processor, you know, and the toolbar, a lot of the things look similar, you know, so mm -hmm. it's, it's not hard to make that jump and really make a great looking website with, you know, very little, you don't have to know how to write HTML or, you know, like you said, it's what you see is what you get, so it's, it's awesome. I'll go ahead and jump in on a couple of those things as well. Um, let me pull up my screen here while I'm chatting about all of this. Um, yeah, uh, Google Calendar um, ha has really been um, used extensively um, in, in our buildings and one thing that's worth noting is that it allows you to distribute out the responsibilities. Um, it doesn't just have to be you as the tech person who's updating the calendar for the website anymore. It's, it's easy to distribute things out to the appropriate people who need to be doing that. So like, um, you know, for any of our buildings or our district, you know, I'll create the calendar, but then I'll share it to the, you know, secretary or the building principal or whoever is going to do that. And so then when people come in and they want to take a look at the interactive middle school calendar, then all of the events that are on there on the website, those were put in by a secretary or by a principal or somebody. It was easy to train them on that. We do the same thing, of course, for our computer labs. You know, if people want to sign up for a computer lab, they use a Google form to sign up for it, but then the calendar is controlled through there. Um, we've done a couple of things. Uh, specifically at the middle school this year that are a little bit different um, with calendars. We did do the homework calendars like TJ was saying. It's an excellent idea. It's worked really well. Basically what we've done is um, each teacher has gone in and created sub-calendars for each of their classes and then they just daily put that information into that calendar and then students can come here and parents 
to open up any of these calendars, and then we've put together a little uh, video and a little printable handout there that explains after you open it up how you can then add that calendar, you know, to your Google Calendar. If people aren't, you know, aware of that, basically the idea is once you get a calendar open, if you go down into the bottom corner, uh, there's a plus Google Calendar button that you can use, and that will allow you to add that calendar to your personal calendars. And so the students have been trained on how to go in and build their own uh, personal group of calendars with each of the classes that, that they attend. Um, the other thing we did with Google Calendars this year at the middle school um, was uh, conference scheduling. Um, so we got rid of homework hotline, you know, so we're not paying for that anymore. Now we got rid of a uh, system we used to pay for where we did our conference scheduling. And so what happens now is the parents come here and they uh, log in and it takes them to, here we go, it takes them to a Google site. So this is kind of a blend of sites and calendars here. And it takes them to a Google site and they're, they're logging in with um, a uh, password and, a, and an ID that uh, they're familiar with from other things. We just sync it on over for them. And um, once they get in here, they can view the middle school staff and they can find you know, the teacher they need to schedule with. And when they click on that teacher, what it'll do is it'll open up that teacher's appointment slot calendar. And this is a new thing that Google added this year. It does not show any personal information. It's not their personal calendar. It's their appointment slot calendar. Now, we just had conferences, so I'll have to back up a week here. But basically, what it lets them do is go in and see any available slots that have not yet been claimed. And as a slot gets claimed, it disappears off of the calendar. And so they can come in and say, hey, I want to schedule you know, a, a parent-teacher conference on that evening with you know, these teachers, parent goes in and clicks on those. I won't actually schedule this, but they go in and they can come in and type in information if they want, or they can just go ahead and hit save. But then it claims that slot, and the teacher gets an email that says that's been scheduled. It goes on the teacher's calendar, and it just works really nice. And so we've been able to do all of our parent-teacher conferencing, you know, that way this year. So I guess just a big point to pull from all of that is it just it allows you to distribute out the power to other people. So the parents have the power to schedule the conferences. The teachers have the ability to set when their conferences are. You know, all of these sort of things allows you to train people properly and then let go of it so that uh, the... Uh, the parents, the staff, the students can all have the power to do these things themselves. And I, I don't know if you want to mention it all. I think, isn't it, those appointment slots only show up on, is it week view and day view, I think? Yeah, if, if anybody wants to learn more about that, we do have quite a bit of information available on, on the site there. There's like a little um, help guide that explains how it works. But yeah, if you're in month view, you won't see the appointment slot option. But if you've got your regular calendar open in uh, week view or day view, and if you click to add an event, um, when it pops up, you'll see a, a little link that says new appointment slots. And instead, if you click that instead of a regular event, it'll create this as an appointment slot. Um, the idea being it allows you to share that calendar out with folks so they can't see any of your personal stuff, but they see whatever appointment slots you set are available, and it allows them to sign up for stuff um, straight between them and you without any middleman in there. And I, I think that's really awesome. I mean, I remember when you shared that with us for the first time that you were doing that. And I actually just signed up last week for my daughter's, um, you know, parent-teacher conferences. And, you know, the teacher sent home a, you know, newsletter. Here's the times of available. Every parent had to send something back. Then she had to look at those and then send something back and say that time, you know, is acceptable. You know, this would obviously cut out, like you said, the middleman and really eliminate all that uh, hassle. Yeah, hours and hours and hours of time get saved. And that's the thing. Technology should make life easier for us. So because we're doing this, we're no longer paying for a system to do it, and we're no longer having people shuffling papers all over the place trying to figure out how to arrange this. And so it lets them have time for what they need to do, plan for teaching, instruction, helping students. And that's, you know, one of the other benefits of, you know, Google Apps is that it does make things go much quicker, and it can really save you a lot of time. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I think at this point, you know, we don't want everyone to think that everything, I guess, is, is roses and, and rainbows and unicorns, that, you know, there obviously probably along the way have been some, some challenges and, and some uh, bumps in the road. So, you know, what are some of the things that the three of you, in, in terms of rolling this out and getting everybody on board, you know, what, what comes to your mind as, as a challenge or, or that's been, you know, an obstacle that you've had to overcome? So the... Uh 
the first thing I'll I'll jump on this because this is the the thing that I hear almost every day, um, and I came up with a with a saying is when using Google Docs, we are sacrificing sacrificing cuteness for collaboration. Um, we have so many teachers that are um, you know they take a lot of time in in designing a, a handout or something. Um, a, a newsletter, something that they want to look exactly perfect, and you know I can't blame them for that. That's that's great that they possess that um, ability. But the issue is that you know with Google Docs, it's it's not all 100% there yet. And uh, Mike, fortunately, Microsoft was um, nice enough to change the way they license out their their uh, Office suite, and uh, that significantly cut the bill for us. So we were able to keep. Office 2010 um, as far as um, that. So s teachers still use that, but then they upload it to Google Docs, and then the, the formatting um, of it doesn't look very well. So I would say the, the cuteness, the ease of use um, compared to Office uh, just isn't there yet in the system. So one thing I heard the other day, too, um, and again, the percentages might not be off, but it was a good point, and that is Google, has 20, Google Docs has 20% of the utilities of Office, but it's 80% of what you need. Um, and I think, I mean, to me, that's been very true. There's been a few things, um, and it looks like Eric's going to talk about it, that, you know, aren't in Google Docs, but, you know, 8 out of 10, you know, is pretty good, um, especially, again, it's free. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that a little bit. Um, as far as um, challenges, th that certainly would be one as to where does Google Docs differ from Microsoft Office. Again, we rolled this out last year. Um, and just as a word of advice, um, I would not encourage people to take away Microsoft Office um, right away, uh, and maybe never, but we have not. We have not taken Office away from our staff. Now, keep in mind, we're we're the ones with the low budget, so the teachers have Office 2002. <laughs> so it's it's pretty old at this point. We just have never been able to uh, to upgrade. Um, but the thing is, if you give them Google Docs alongside of Microsoft Office, it's going to be a much more pleasant experience because they're going to say, not oh, I can't do this and I can't do that. Instead, they're going to say, oh, look at these things I can do. And they, they're going to love the collaboration, and they're going to love the revision history, and they're going to love sharing, and they're going to love instant saving, and they're going to love access anywhere, anytime. They're going to love those sort of things, and they'll find the use cases for using that. But it is good to note there are significant differences. They certainly are there. Um, there's no clip art just built into Google Docs. So, you know, if they want to throw clip art and stuff, yeah, there's absolutely ways to achieve this. And we've done workarounds and we've got public domain clip art that we've put on a shared network drive that they can get to. And we've talked about good ways to find clip art and things like that. But no, it doesn't come with clip art just right in there. Um, it does not do mail merge. That you know is, is a critical thing for some folks. Uh, Google Docs does not handle columns well or at all. You sort of have to use tables if you want to try to do columns. Um, more advanced image placement isn't quite right. If you want to put um, images in Docs one on top of the other and do like you know front and back sort of stuff, um, that's that doesn't work quite the way you would want it to. Um, in, in Google Presentations, which is like their version of PowerPoint, it doesn't have cute animations and sound effects, which maybe you're happy <laughs> that it doesn't do the typewriter effect and all the zooming and all that sort of stuff. So yes, there are things that aren't there, but I, I do definitely want to mention two things about that. One is Google is constantly adding new features. And so things that I, if, if we recorded this a year ago, I would have been saying, Google doesn't handle page numbers right. Well, now it does. You know, and I'd be saying, Google doesn't do vertical merge in spreadsheets. Well, now it does. And they're constantly, constantly adding new features. So they're going to have these things eventually. They're going to be in there. But the other thing to mention is I, I think that I wanted to practice what I preached. And so when we made this switch two years ago, uh, six months before the switch, I said, that's it. I'm going Google Docs all, all in. I, I, as much as possible, I am not going to use any of my Microsoft products. I love Office. I think it's a fantastic suite. Do not get me wrong there at all. But I needed to say, if I'm going to tell people to do this, I've got to live it. And guys, I mean, you, your, your percentages might be right there, TJ, but honestly, it's I, I don't think it's 
unfair for me to say it does 95% of what I need. And I use computers constantly. The only thing I go back to office for really is mail merge. I mean, that's pretty much it. Other than that, even crazy spreadsheet things now, Google Spreadsheet now does filtering and it does all of those things. So, I mean, really about 95% of everything I do is completely inside of Docs. But yes, there are going to be some things you run up against and you do have to work with your teachers on that. I liked Eric G's suggestion. We are doing a little bit of a you know a trade off here. You know, it maybe isn't as cute, but we are getting a lot of other awesome features. Luckily for us, one of our district goals was collaboration. So I said, well cuteness unfortunately is not a district goal, perhaps next year. <laughs> but this year it's collaboration. We'll try to so. squeeze it in next year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's on the and list, just not high. I think it's important to point out, too, kind of piggybacking on what Eric C. is saying, is that, you know, if you do want to do those things that you find are, are missing, you know, then you can save it as a Word or you can save it as a PowerPoint and add those finishing touches when you've kind of got, you know, your documents set up the way that you want or, you know, you've got your slideshow put together. You know, that's one thing I hear, too. You know, the presentation piece, I think, is, and you guys probably would agree, is the weakest of the uh, Google Docs uh, suite. Uh, you know, there's no transitions, there's no animations, but if that's important to you, you know, certainly work on it in Docs, you know, because it does have that really strong collaboration to it, and then download it and, and finish it in PowerPoint, you know, if, if that's really critical to your, to your job or what you're doing. I think that's one thing worth mentioning, too. Um, when you put stuff, and this might be an advanced topic or whatever, um, but when you put something in Google, on um, Google Docs, like let's say you do have a PowerPoint, you don't have to convert it to be a Google Doc. You know, so it can be just your storage, so you can pull it down, still giving you that access wherever you need it. And uh, TJ hit on possibly one of my uh, challenges, and that would be uh, the amount of storage. Um, you know, as, as we know, uh, because we all manage this, any Google Doc or any type of Google Doc, whether it's um, a, a Google Doc, a Google presentation, you know, spreadsheet, whatever, that doesn't account or that doesn't cost you any storage. It's all zero. It's when you start to throw in other Word documents, other things like that, that's when they start, you know, charging you for storage, and they only give you one gig by default. I had a few teachers this year that, um, you know, they're up in the multiple gigs of storage um, as far as what they uh, kept and it's you know maybe that's it's because they're pack rats they find a CD full of PDFs that they like and then they uh, just keep that but um, you know I uh, it's like finding Nemo isn't it mine mine mine, mine. yeah exactly um, so but you know they're it's it's their their way of uh, keeping content for themselves and and I said just at first they said yeah just don't convert it upload it and then you know, eight minutes later after they've already filled up their gig of storage, I thought, oh, okay. So what I'm hoping is that Google comes out with some sort of way for me as an administrator to purchase more, purchase more storage and then reallocate it. Because as is right now, that individual teacher said, what is it, five bucks and I get 20 gigs? Okay, I'll buy that. You know, so that's what they ended up doing. But because they were, you know, they, it was kind of an unfair uh, issue in their mind, they said, you know, well, why doesn't the school give me twenty dollars, and then I'll increase my storage? Okay, this is again a free service we're using. You know, I'm I'm assuming eventually one day Google will open it up so that a school district can buy storage and then reallocate it as needed. But uh, that would or, be one of my challenges. Or possibly they may increase the amount of space. And I mean, I don't have any you know inside scoop on that, but we saw what they did with Gmail. It was yep. 7 gigs, and they just said, hey, it's 25 gigs now. Boom, and it just came yep. out like that. You know, uh, And if they're going to compete you know, with uh, some of the other services out there, you know, with Docs still being capped at a gig, um, I, I would not be surprised if we see that change sometime in the near future. I certainly am hoping so. Uh, but again, it does depend on what you load into there. I mean, I think I've got... You know, I'm how many hundred docs in there, hundreds of docs, and I'm at like one percent of my storage space because I just don't put non Google stuff in there very often. And uh, kind of going along with docs, one thing that I've come across at least recently talking to to teachers and, and administrators is they're concerned about the chat feature in Google Docs. You know that that's not something that you can turn off. You know that that's going to be there for that for that collaboration. And um, at least what I've heard, and you guys can kind of jump in on this, um, but 
the thought is, you know, that's just part of being a good teacher and, and managing your classroom and staying on top of it, you know, and making sure that they're, you know, not using that chat, I guess, for nefarious reasons. Um, but, you know, there's, there's nothing really stopping them, though, from sending a text message on their phone or, or you know, finding other ways to do it. So, what, I mean, how do you guys address that in terms of, you know, there's no record of that chat? Right. I, um, I always put it to, you know, students wrote nut stuff on the desk. Do we take away the desks? And, and we don't. I mean, there's no different than them passing a note. And it's easy for me to sit back and say, oh, that's classroom management um, because I'm not in the classroom. Um, but I've had a lot of teachers that say, you know, that other ones have said, no, I keep an eye on it. I'm in the document. I see what they're doing. You know, and it really has not been an issue at all. Um, and I don't know if that's more because students don't think to use it like that. Um, but honestly, they're on Twitter, they're on my yearbook more than they're, you know, that's how they're going to communicate. They're not going to use a Google Doc, you know, on school, you know, school grounds per se. Um, if they're going to do anything nefarious, you know, they're going to do it on one of those public sites or, like you said, a text message. Yeah, the, the worst thing about the, uh, you know, monitoring in the classroom um, that I've seen is there is no limit as to what you can put in your Google Docs account. So if it's an inappropriate image or an inappropriate video, uh, you know, my filter is not going to block that because it just sees it as Google Docs. So luckily, hopefully no students are watching this podcast, but, you know, that's potentially going to be an issue uh, in the future. And, you know, if Google can, I'm sorry, if Google has the power to sort images and sort videos by color, by, you know, content and all that stuff, I would assume that that technology will I don't know how soon, but be applied to uh, Google Docs and allow us to filter it here. But, uh, Can you explain that? Explain that one more time. I'm sorry. So if let's say they're inserting something, like inserting something into a document. No, not even a document. If I go to Google Docs, you know, my homepage, and I decide to upload a inappropriate video oh, or an oh, inappropriate okay. I thought picture, are able to. And that's yeah. someone said that the other day, and I said that's no different than them bringing a Playboy in their book bag. I love these little analogies, but it makes them think, like, why it's technology. It's no different than, you know, the book bag and the desk. I mean, it's no different. It's just, like, what they're, you know, follow the same procedure you would this way. Yep. But that's a good point. That's, they could upload, yeah. But what ends up being nice, to a degree anyway, with Google Docs is that they're typically is a digital paper trail there. I mean, it's a little bit easier. I mean, we've had, uh, you know, we have email that we've given out to all of our students. Now, we do use uh, the, the, the Postini message security to control who can email whom and so forth and so on. Uh, but we've had, in two years now, I think, one, maybe two occurrences where a student sent something even slightly inappropriate, but I mean, it's all completely documented. I mean, you can, it's like, well, it's from this account to this account, or if it's in a document, you can see exactly who did it. So you're right, we do need to keep in mind, how does this compare to what we would have done in the past and apply those ideas to it, but we do get that benefit that we can track a lot of it a lot easier than we used to be able to. And one thing that I've noticed, too, just logging in, because I'm an all-Apple school, so I have Apple remote desktop, and logging into this, like, a computer and, you know, taking control of it, you know, that news spreads quick. And when they're on, you know, Twitter.com or whatever website they're on, I go in there and say, really? Like, this is what you're doing? And that word gets out, like, just letting know, almost like the Big Brother effect. And it seems like that's really kind of gone throughout the school that I've heard. And just letting them know that you're there has also helped. Like, we're watching. Yeah, I've, uh, I've used my Log Me In app, and I've walked up behind a kid with my iPad, and I said, really? You're spending your time watching YouTube doing this? And, you know, they'll quickly switch back to it, and I'll switch, you know, or they'll quickly switch away f- from it, and I'll switch right back to it and say, come on now, use, you know, have better use of your time here. And I'll shut out the window, and they're just... You know, I, I'm sure creeped the out a little bit. The best is playing the games, though. If you see, like, a Flash game up, that's my favorite one, where you just control their little mini bike and wreck it. <laughs> anyway, I digress. <laughs> Rat hole. So one thing that we haven't talked about, and we're kind of, uh, we've been podcasting now for 10 hours, so we probably need to uh, <laughs> think about wrapping this up, is, you know, getting users to change. And, you know, we've kind of talked about, you know, what are some of the things that are missing from Google Apps and, you know, things that, you know, each of these 
your different districts have kind of overcome, but you know, how do you get your, your staff and your administrators on board and, and really get everybody behind Google Apps? You know, what are some of the things that you guys did um, in terms of PD or you know, building up a momentum to make this successful? I started uh, two different places. I did a top-down and grassroots campaign, and then they met in the middle. You know, I trained administration and staff, and uh, as long as everybody was on board with it and everybody felt it was their idea at the same time, you know, it really worked out well. I also mentioned the cost, and that helped out a little. So. Yeah, I think I think training is is critical. Um, absolutely. Um, when we rolled it out, we sent all of our staff through you know uh, training on a staff work day before the school year started. So everybody, all 600 employees, pretty much went through uh, some sort of training, and then uh, just trying to provide as much you know opportunities for additional PD as possible after school classes, uh, you know, helpful videos, help guides, things like that. Um, you know, really goes goes a long way. Um, but like I said, you know, one of the things that I think really did help was not just going cold turkey and saying we're taking Office away from you and now you're using Docs, but instead helping them see the benefits of this and then putting your energy into those people that are the early adopters, those people that get excited about it, and, and you know, because they're going to be the best folks to spread the word for you. Um, and then other than that, we are now to a point where we are giving a little bit more of a push. I know I've said a couple times we didn't take away Office. Well, we did this year with students, grades K through 8. And so we did a lot of talk last year, spoke to the uh, teachers. And what we decided was that for what students need to do, there really was no longer a rationale why we would have to use Office up through grade 8. And so we did take Office uh, away uh, up, through our middle, up through our middle school. And the idea behind that is, that is going to now, like Eric was saying, you know, it's kind of grassroots coming up. Now, as students are only using Google Docs, they're now going to be turning in their assignments by sharing them to their teachers with Google Docs, and that will create more teacher use of Google Docs. And so, you know, we're kind of going around the back on that one, and uh, the students don't care. I mean, they're like, well, no problem. They're just in it using it. You know, they're not afraid of it at all. And so that's just another way to give a little bit more oomph to gently push people toward, toward more and more use of it. One thing I want to talk about too is if you are planning on doing this, um, specifically with email, the transition, um, this side note, I came to Huron uh, in May and the guy before me, Gary Larizza, had already started this and he was going to switch it over um, in August, like the first week of August, so two weeks before school started. Um, we had some issues with mail delivery and I finally said, you know, we're doing this before summer. And it was the best decision I made. So my thought process is, think of it in the teacher's eyes. When are they going to be their busiest when we come back to school? So if you force them, quote unquote force them, uh, to use it over the summer, it at least lets them try it and use it a little bit um, because they don't have any other options. And it was such a smooth year um, coming in this year. Everybody was comfortable with it. And we actually had... Um, in, we actually got subs um, for each building. Uh, we did two. We broke it up into two. We're 1,500 students, um, so we're a smaller district than North Canton. But we broke it up. Each building had two sessions, so everybody knew how to use it inside and out. Um, and then also, like um, I think Eric said, um, all the way from maintenance all the way up, coaches, everybody in the district has to know how to use it, and they love it. Um, there was some, I think first, we were on first class for seven years, I believe, um, so they were really, I see, I see some people, are, they hear first class and it's just, they cringe. Um, and it was a very smooth transition. Um, again, with the right amount of training and follow-up, um, I offer PD twice a week, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and we cover various different topics, but, you know, we're 100%, you know, without a doubt, great with Gmail, and now the push is the docs, and I'm thinking the same thing about pulling it, um, starting in the younger grades. This, this week I had a second grade teacher say, hey, can you create some Google Docs accounts for me? You know, I want my second graders to have access to this, and it was just, we, they had never done that. You know, they started in, earliest was maybe fourth grade, um, and they want to start, you know, getting them and getting them typing, and why not? And I just think it's great that it's going down to that level. And the fact that Gmail is mod or Google Apps is modular, I can turn off things like email. And 
I mean, it's just, it's great. All right. Well, um, I think at this point, maybe we want to mention some of the different uh, resources. And again, this is just sort of the short list. Um, you know, everything that we've talked about today, some of the different templates and, and the other things are going to be in our show notes. So definitely check that out. Um, Eric, see if you want to talk a little bit about the apps users group you set up. Sure thing. Um, let me go ahead and grab that. Um, there we go. Uh, yeah, when we went ahead and rolled over to Google Apps, um, we got a lot of you know help from districts around us and learned an awful lot through that. But at that point, this was again you know over a year or so ago, um, there weren't a whole lot of. Um, websites specifically dedicated to sharing ideas about Google Apps that has since changed there as, as Sean will mention there's definitely other options out there now uh, but at that, that time there wasn't and so um, we went ahead and put together a website called apps user group and so it's just www.appsusergroup.org and basically the point of the site is to help connect and assist schools all over with the use of Google Apps and so um, on the site you're gonna find you know, all sorts of news information, articles. Um, I write some articles. Uh, TJ, you've submitted some things. You know, we've got all sorts of great articles there. But beyond that, we have a, a discussion forum where you can sign up. It's a uh, it's a, a Google group. I think we've got probably I don't know. See how many people are in there. Oops. There we go, about 95 different people are in that discussion group. So you can ask a question if you're not sure about something, and somebody is bound to assist you with any questions that you have. Uh, we've got resources, so um, all sorts of handouts, help guides, videos covering everything from Postini to Google Forms to implementation of Google Apps to programming, all sorts of stuff there. Ideas for use, a lot of the things you heard today, plus many, many, many more are all linked in here on how to use calendar and docs and spreadsheets and forms and sites, a list of schools that are using Google Docs or using Google Apps so you can go in there and add your own school to this list and you can add anything to the site. There's forms on every page where you can submit an idea, submit a resource, add your school uh, and there's a calendar with training events that are coming up and so on. So I would encourage folks that either are using Google Apps or just curious about it, go ahead and head over to appsusergroup.org and you can um, follow us on Twitter there as well as get on the discussion forum and so forth. So that's um, a, a real good resource that I think uh, folks can uh, can benefit from. I want to take a moment right now and kind of jump in and say thank you uh, for that. Uh, that has helped me at both districts that I've worked at. Um, tremendous people on there um, and there's just so much knowledge. So I mean hats off to you, round of applause for doing that for the community. Um, and you know, I can't thank you enough for that. Well, thank you for all the stuff you contributed because <laughs> you, you write some good stuff on there too. So I appreciate Thanks. it. So uh, as Eric alluded to, you know, at the time that was kind of um, one of the only discussion groups that was available. But there is now a K-12 Great Lakes users group, uh, which also does include Ohio. Um, and the web address for that is k12greatlakes.appsusersgroup.com. And, you know, besides having a forum, uh, you know, there's two forums set up, one I think for just general discussion, one for technical questions. And, you know, there's a lot of good resources there as well. Also finding other schools that are using uh, Google Apps. And I've found, you know, that people are, you know, great about, getting back to you if you have a question fairly quickly uh, within a couple of minutes two or three people will chime in and and try to help you with whatever issue you're having so you know those are two of the resources but again you know definitely look at our show notes because we're gonna have a lot more there for you to uh, tap into all right Eric uh, G do you want to tell people how they can get in touch with us and take part in our show yep first I was gonna let uh, TJ let uh, the folks at, at home know how to contact him Yes, and I am always available. Um, I put my cell phone number out there, 419-975-9749. Um, it's a Google Voice number. Um, I'm always available to help. Um, I'm on, at Twitter, um, at, on Twitter at TJ Houston. Um, you can find me blogging. It's a little stale now that the year started. Don't have as much free time, but tjhouston.com. Um, Google Plus, reach out to me. I'm, I'm more than happy to help. Um, I feel like this is a round table and I need to say, hello, my name is TJ Houston. I have a Google Apps problem. Um, <laughs> just let me know if you need anything. I'm absolutely more than willing to help. Gotcha. Thank and, you. And we, yeah, I was going to say, we really want to thank you, TJ, for, for kind of being on our inaugural podcast. It's been great. And you, I think, really added a lot of uh, info and 
hopefully we'll have you back for a future episode. I appreciate that. Great. And speaking of future episodes, uh, um, Sean, I didn't know if you wanted to mention next uh, month's episode information or not. Sure. Um, next month is going to be, well, we should say this month in two weeks is going to be uh, <laughs> BYOT on the 22nd. Uh, and so we should have some pretty uh, awesome guests for that episode. And then on uh, November 5th, we're going to be talking about tablets. So hopefully, you know, it's, I think this is an exciting time because the uh, Amazon Fire just got announced. And, uh, you know, it's a $200 tablet. And we've got the iPad and a lot of Android tablets. So hopefully we'll have a really good discussion on that. And if you're interested... We do have surveys posted on our site, and Eric's going to tell you about that in a minute here. But please do, if you have anything that you'd like to submit, uh, or even if you'd like to be a guest, we'd love to hear from you. Yep. Eric, any final thoughts? Uh, no. Uh, excellent. Uh, again, thanks, TJ, for being with us. And I would just, uh, again, reiterate, check the show notes, because there's so many awesome things that we just can't quite possibly fit into an hour, and we've tried to include other links in there as well, and definitely encourage people to uh, um, follow us on Twitter and all these wonderful things that Eric G. is going to tell us about here. So thanks. Yes, and um, the most important thing we want to do is, again, thank the audience for watching or listening to us today. Um, you can contact us by, uh, we have a Google Voice phone number. It's 513-318-TECH. -E uh, you can reach us also on Twitter at, at the State of Tech, or uh, email us uh, at, let's see, the State of Tech at gmail.com. So don't forget that our show notes are available on line at thestateoftech.org and I don't know if you've seen our website as of late but uh, I will show that up here right now. It's an absolute big, big, big shout out to the graphic design abilities of Eric G <laughs> who has done a wonderful job of creating those heads of us there. So uh, seriously, again, hats off to somebody really, really nice job with that. And while we're saying, while we're saying congratulations when you do hear the podcast, the music written by Sean. So when you hear the little intro and outro music, that's Sean. So we got a talented group of folks here. Pretty awesome. Talent squirting out uh, the side of every bit of the show. So yes. So the state of tech podcast dot. I'm sorry. The state of tech dot org. And please leave a comment on our blog. Let us know. You know how we did. Or uh, you know if you have hate mail to send to Sean. I, I know I have quite a bit of work to type uh, type up some letters here soon. Also, uh, you know, again, fill out our survey for next month. That'll be posted there as well. Lastly, rate us on iTunes. Um, that lets us know. Uh, you know, and ups us in the the ratings for our podcast and allows uh, more folks to download us. So uh, this has been the State of Tech. We will see you in two weeks for the next State of Tech.